Everything Great About Baby Driver has been sponsored by Squarespace. Need a new website, domain, or online store? Squarespace is the place to make it happen. This opening scene is a masterpiece. Thank you, Edgar Wright. I could probably talk about it for half an hour, but here are the cliff notes or highlights that make it all a win. The first two shots isolate the most important elements of this film a car, and music. We get a ton of exposition done purely through the visuals. The entire scene is perfectly timed to bell bottoms played over top, every door slam in tempo. Every beat is a cut to a character being introduced. And just by the coloring of Baby's black and white jacket, we're told that he doesn't really fit in with the black trench coat crew, even if he is caught between worlds. And then Baby breaks his stoic facade and lets us know he's just a kid in love with music. And much like James Gunn did with Baby Groot in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Edgar Wright allows the more interesting action, the bank robbery, to go on in the background while we stay with our hero. And just when you think Baby might be a little freaked out by the crime, you realize he's just waiting for more words to lip sync. At this point in the story, he's almost completely compartmentalized the crime side of his life. And fun fact, Edgar Wright has wanted to make this movie for a long time, because he always envisioned a car chase put to this song. Ah, <laughs> Rick's bestie Shane pointing forward and Baby taking off backward might be my favorite part of this entire film. And keen-eyed viewers wouldn't have been surprised since we see Baby put the car in reverse. Plus, the copters drove in the other direction. And then Edgar Wright surpassed a bunch of modern driving films with this one practically shot drift at about three seconds, honoring all the films that inspired this film. Also, just yup. Every single sound effect is on beat, in time. Light change, car crash, gear shift. Oh, oh! <laughs> oh, yep. Cuts are quick, but not too quick. We spend just as much time inside the car as out, and since they're all actually in the car while it's driving at high speeds, it feels completely real. And we learn really quickly that Baby isn't just a good driver. He's intentionally hit spike strips with the sidewall of your tire good. Indeed, he's car shell game good. You gosh darn right it is. You just sat through six minutes of a film with no spoken words other than song lyrics and passenger gasps, and you know all you need to know. Huh, just the up angle shot of the building would be enough of an epic title card, but there's also the hint of a double yellow line like the road stretch out before baby. Also, shame on you for thinking this was House of Pain like probably 90% of everyone everywhere, including me. Shame on us. And not to break up this awesome song, but this second sequence is also a masterpiece. In fact, for me, it actually supersedes the car chase. Edgar Wright is always a win. This scene alone is reason enough. This one long tracking Steadicam take is almost three minutes long. As Baby walks along the street, not one full frame goes by without words from the song being written in graffiti on buildings as stickers stuck around, carved into trees, or painted on the sidewalk. Every sound effect, including car horns, ATM beeps, and motorcycle revs are all in time and a part of the song. Baby even acts some sections out, like sliding and scuffling. He even stalls his drink order so he can sing along and stay in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then Edgar slyly introduces the main love interest, Deborah, marching along to Harlem Shuffle in her yellow skirt, and we see Baby's heart turn from black to red. Even on the way back, graffiti has been added to go along with the song lyrics. And if you weren't mesmerized by all that, there's also a story being told. Baby's intern coffee gopher status is being solidified, and we see again how happy-go-lucky he is when he's not with a crew. And this might be a stretch, but things go pretty smoothly on his walk to get coffee, but once he sees Deborah and starts back towards Doc and crime, things go sour. He sees a cop, gets yelled at by a fanatic, and almost gets hit by a bike and then a car. <sighs> what are we, like, 10 minutes in here? That has to be a record. Are you a mute? No. Honesty. For God's sake. In his car, keep his white shirt clean while the rest of us, we roll in the dirt. One of these... Unflappability. If you don't see me again, it's because I'm dead. Well, that settles that. But he does live on his Pete Castiglione. Until that fateful sledgehammer-filled day. What was he talking about? Oh, right. John Bernthal is the man, and Netflix is the Punisher is amazing. And no, none of that is a spoiler. Stop cursing at me in the comments. I'm still sick. Cut me some slack. These camera movements might seem totally unnecessary and just flourish, but they actually sell the musical stylizing perfectly. Also, Baby is now wearing just his white undershirt. He's not in conflict over taking care of his foster dad. And if you happen to question how they got that picture, who would? But just in case, Edgar Wright threw this camera flash into the chase scene when he runs the red light. Jim Halper, I mean John Krasinski is always a win. Who's cautiously excited for A Quiet Place? Our eyes are immediately drawn to the same tape that Baby's eyes are drawn to every time he opens that case. They call, I go, you know. Unless Buddy tells you otherwise. Do me a favor, next time Doc calls, don't pick up. Well, aren't you mysterious? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe? <laughs> the chemistry between these two. Over here is Eddie No-Nose, formerly Eddie the Nose. 
Well, what happened? Don't ask me that. That's a no nose, no no, page one. Better than no thumbs, am I right? Eh? Good for you, Flea. I'm the one got the mental problems in the crew. That checks out. He's got tinnitus. Tinnitus? You know he had an accident when he was a kid. He still got a hum in the drum. So, not to get into a whole thing like I just did with my wife, but apparently in the medical field where she's a PA, it's tinnitus. It hurts my mouth, so I won't keep saying it, but I just wanted Edgar Wright to know that the way he pronounces it is apparently correct, even in the States. More importantly is that throughout the film, when there isn't any music and just silence, you can often hear the ringing that someone suffering from Archer's favorite injury to complain about hears constantly. I can attest. Wear earplugs when using chainsaws, children. But even the score plays into it with the high strings right in the opening scene, solidifying Baby as the main character and the one we should be sympathetic towards. That's my baby. Kill Baby. Only Jamie Foxx could say something so crass and still get a chuckle. Doc said Michael Myers. This is Mike Myers. No, the killer dude from Halloween. Oh, you mean Jason. No. Well, Mike Myers was in So I Married an Axe Murderer. Though Michael Myers was more into knives. Jason liked machetes. It's just a good joke. Man, I'm a tough business. Second hint that Bats is Batcha. Hey, I just got his name. <laughs> Yeah, maybe no more cops, but Neat 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 doesn't say anything about Marines. Also, thank you Edgar Wright for exposing my huge gap in punk music with the dam. Merciful incapacitation through skilled J-turn. <laughs> Snap! So that's why my wife hates driving next to big trucks. Same coffee run song performed by a different band gets you different feelings. One of my favorite transitions in this film, a simple match cut, just not so simple to execute practically. I'm easy like Sunday morning. Fun slow motion shot where Ansel is actually singing with a faster version of the song so that it's in time when the footage of him is slowed down. Deborah, the song I'm talking about. Okay, <laughs> bye. Trex. T-Rex? Ooh, been there, buddy. We've all got gaps. Apparently it's not Dead Mouth 5, and it's not called a meme, or K dollar sign ha. All right, I made the last one up. But the point is, foster kid who probably didn't finish elementary school is going to have some gaps in knowledge. You're in a pink and glittery mood. I am now. <laughs> Flirting. Whatever the significance, I have some theories I'll get into later. This shot of only primary colors in the dryers is super pleasing to my brain. It's the finest wine and dining of all the wines and dines in town. It's the finest wine and dining of all the wines and dines in town. <laughs> so most everyone caught this stolen line the first time through, but even I missed one of them. Listen to them all first, and then I'll explain why they're important. You are so beautiful. How's that working out for you? They grow up so freaking fast, don't they? You and I are a team. Nothing's more important than our friendship. Baby is a sampler, as in he takes audio from other sources and incorporates it into his life, just like his little mixes. And ironically, we're given all the original songs that have been sampled into more popular, well-known songs. I think my brain might melt when I'm done with this movie. And just like a kid in love, he goes home to immediately listen to the song she talked about. Noel Fielding is always a win. So is everyone else from The Mighty Boosh. But they don't technically feature in the film. And this music video for Mint Royale was Edgar Wright's first stab at his opening to Baby Driver. I said we were straight, but did you think we were done? That that was it? He was careful about his choice of words. One more job and I'm done. One more job and we're straight. And you're all straight, baby. That's it? Sure is. You're all paid up. Beating your gal catfish dipped in gold. Is that a thing? Is that a thing people want? Should I should I want that? Love. And important scene where Deborah tells Baby, You don't have to worry about me. And she means it. She's in for the long haul. No band in class. One hop record. Ten cameras. Eight registers. Helpfulness. Just say boo, and she'll give you the big bills first. Chips off the old block. Don't you mean chip off the old dock? You're going up in the world. He is, but not in the way you want him to. I mean, literally, he's using the stairs even though Doc called the elevator for him. Holy calamity! This does not sound like Jet Airliner. However, I will say they added a whole different tone and emotion to the Steve Miller Band intro song. And the framing of each character near a door but on the other side of this dark room like a wall of darkness between them, which there totally is. There's an exact same thing. Barbara Streisand. Darling, do look like I know a thing about Barbara Streisand. Barbara Streisand lessons. You ladies listen to Queen. 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 Streisand now, Queen. Yeah, you ain't got nothing on Freddie Mercury. He bought it a little later, but it had nothing to do with the heist. Did he just admit to killing that guy by pulling his tattoo trigger? 
you should know by now it's not going to be Dre and Snoop. You want me to kill bats? Not before the job, silly. Hmm? The setup of the ultimate baddie is done so well. In the preceding scene, we're warm to Buddy as he reaches out to Baby, and then pits himself opposite Bats again with the whole Hex song argument. Then the very next scene, we find out that he is indeed a true criminal. From the jowl comes the god sent Roman bacon that is Juan Chiale. So, this whole Guns is Pig product speech is exactly as overwrought and pretentious as I'd expect from the guy who wrote Rainbow Connection for the Muppets movie. I'm just curious how he thinks Kermit will feel about him using Miss Piggy in his analogy. Okay, so the opening scene's amazing. The dance number long take is amazing. But as far as timing and essentially playing music with gunfire goes, this shootout takes the freaking cake. Go back and watch this scene again. Not one gunshot is out of time. Even the volume and duration of shots are musically appropriate. As Paul Williams says, Fantastic. Also helping your girlfriend out of a jam. At least it better be what he's doing since she was already firing. Sometimes it's just too much. Too good. Ooh, you know I'm gonna list off a bunch of awesome details in the conclusion, but some are just too good to not bring up now. We actually see Baby grab a crayon and napkin to leave this note and then is bent over writing it. Good stuff. Maybe you disappear into a world consistent of three things, money, sex, drugs, and action. Well, that's well. Counting win. I got this. Saving your new, almost, girlfriend. Bananas. I did not hear the word bananas tonight. Maybe you just had something clogging your ears. Why don't you play us something, baby? One of those situations where you actually feel at ease because we know he does actually make mixes. But then Doc picks the wrong tape. I don't screw to the cops, I screw on the road. Now I'm not slow, I'm fast. And it's actually refreshing to see Baby finally stand up for himself in the only way he knows how, repeating everyone's lines back to them. But it goes a long way in making his final decision to move in the next scene seem right in line with where his head's at. <laughs> and brutal. He moved. Come up and And a total expectations aversion. The news report was setting up slippery roads and construction. Scattered thunderstorm advisory through 4 p.m. Ongoing construction work. Foreshadowing what's going to be a tricky escape by car, and then bang! The guy you assume will be the main villain is out. And he had to be. Baby knows he was itching to kill him and Debbie, so he had to go. And one more awesome timed flea this time on foot. Perfectly synced with Focus's Hocus Pocus and another amazingly used song. Having Baby take a break to hide during the calmer yodeling section and then take off again once the electric guitar rips back in. I know it's not new to use music to set the pace, but Wright did it in reverse order by picking already written songs before filming the scene. And if you think about it, Skill on the Road is about thinking ahead and quick reflexes. So I believe he'd be good on foot as well. This, this is why people love Edgar Wright. That's a practical camera movement. There were a million easy ways to film that shot, but no. He had the camera operator back out of a van to make this awesome aesthetic. We gotta get out of here, all right? Thanks for <laughs> Deaf guy jokes. Never Never Gonna Give You Up has taken on a whole new meaning. I'm Something I brought up in Scott Pilgrim is how Edgar rarely uses the same shot twice. It's something you'll notice in Baby Driver as well. You'll also notice in this scene especially how the camera pushes in on every actor, bringing them all closer to our perspective and ramping the tension. We're doing just fine. Isn't that right, baby? Nice quick thinking. And defending the woman you love is as good a reason as any to start using guns. Can you show me where you've been shot? Yeah. Right there. He asked. And when the show was finally finished, I'll be taking my back. I'm never trying to go out. <laughs> How many cameramen died in the making of this film? Okay, go get your tape. I think something to remember here is that while, yes, Doc does threaten Deborah earlier. Waitress girlfriend, she's cute. Let's keep it that way. As far as he was concerned, that was just a fling. Baby wasn't being himself. He had taken her to the finest wine and dining just to impress her. Now that Doc sees that she's really with him after everything that's happened, I get the feeling that this hits home for him. I was in love once. Maybe his true love left him because of his life of crime. And he clearly feels protective over Baby. Just because he no. said, You can break your legs and kill everyone you love, doesn't mean he ever had any intention of actually doing that. He needed Baby, and threats were the easiest way to keep him around. <laughs> Brutal. Darling wasn't lying, but he is relentless and he's seeing red. You haven't seen how relentless he is. Because when he sees red, you see nothing but black. Queen is always a win. Also, yup. And man, was he not wrong about Brighton Rock being a killer driving song. No! Teamwork. Yourself, baby. You child. And I really wouldn't have pegged the madman as a great choice for a final boss, but hot dang does he deliver. Hey, you okay, buddy? I'm not 
not your buddy, friend. You buddy. I'm not your buddy, guy! I would have seen this coming, buddy. You took something away from me that I love. You know I gotta do the same. First of all, buddy, that's already two things. But do anyone else's ears immediately start ringing after that? Come up and You don't belong in this world. Self-sacrifice. A realistic ending to Baby's story. He may be a decent guy, but there's still consequences to your actions, and this was the only way to make sure Deborah wasn't implicated. Pressured even harder. That is the voice of Walter Hill, the director of The Driver. You can't get used to the fact that your real name is Miles. I kind of like that he was sort of protecting her from the beginning with some plausible deniability. She never even knew his real name. That's true love. And you finally get that rainbow after earning it through the rain. Everybody wants happiness, nobody wants pain, but you can't have a rainbow without a little rain. Although, I will say that I personally think this very well could be in Baby's head. I'm not saying she won't be there waiting for him in his 50s fantasy after five years, but everything we know about Baby leads me to believe this is a dream. For starters, he had a very similar fantasy, and he lives through media, music, TV, and movies. So it just sort of fits. They call me Baby Driver. But who's going to complain about this happy ending with Simon and Garfunkel's song giving us a literal roll credits? Whoa, these credits are only like three minutes long, and pretty well spaced out at that. Testament to a practical film. I just want to get this out of the way quickly. I can be honest and say that Kevin Spacey was on my always a win list. He has always been one of my favorite actors. As much as I can separate actors' talents from their personal lives, there is a line. That being said, I won't skip movies that contain people on this ever-growing list because it would be a disservice to everyone else involved. Plus, this is probably his last appearance anyway. I'll just have to see how things go in covering past movies. Based on the box office return of Baby Driver, I must have a few people watching this video right now that this was, is, your first and only Edgar Wright film. And to that I say, if you enjoyed this movie, go watch the Cornetto Trilogy, which is Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and The World's End. Also watch Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Each of the things that you enjoyed in this film are individually amplified in all of his other films. The music, the long takes, the poignant jump cuts, the sharp transitions, the witty dialogue, it's all in there. One of the highest scored videos on my channel is Scott Pilgrim, so that should tell you what I think about Edgar Wright. Then, after watching all those movies, see his next film in theaters. He's a director that has never disappointed me, and of the handful of directors who deserve our consistent theater money, he's right near the top of that list. And if you watch this video without seeing Baby Driver first, go watch it. This video does not and cannot do its majesty justice. Edgar Wright has been called a style over substance director, and to that I say... What you got a good style? I don't think anyone would necessarily level that complaint at Baby Driver, with its tight narrative and structure, strong characters, and every loose end tied up. Nonetheless, I feel the need to defend it. Baby Driver in no way lacks substance. Yet Edgar Wright was still able to stylize every single moment in some of the most satisfying ways. You know how I feel about musicals? I'm slowly coming around. But if there was ever a musical I could get behind, it's an action movie choreographed to music spanning the last five decades. I went into this movie pretty blind, and based on what I've heard Edgar say, I don't think he wants it to be classified as a musical, probably for fear of turning people like me off. And there's minimal original music, but the way every song is incorporated into the film is as musical-esque as it gets. And the music in the film is just plain amazing. It's so uncompromisingly diegetic that when a song runs out, Baby rewinds his iPod in order to score the rest of the chase. If the crew stalls a little bit and messes up his flow, he asks them to wait so he can restart the song. Thematically, music is the one connection Baby has to his mother. In the same way he would drown out his parents fighting an abusive father, he now drowns out the reality of the ramifications of the crash and the memory of his mother's death. And in a history repeats itself kind of way, he chooses to end his abusive relationship with Bats the same way his mother ended hers. Then his final moments in the car with her song Easy play almost ironically as you consider what Baby's life has been and everything that's led to this moment. But it's not melancholy. It is easy for him to choose Deborah over himself. One of the few things I didn't touch on outside the obvious is the color coding of the characters. Bats is obviously always red, red, red. Buddy is blue, 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 and Darling is pink, violet. I talked about Baby's jacket being caught between his two worlds, and his glasses progressively get lighter until he's actually missing a lens by the end, showing how he's finally not blinding himself to the crime and taking some responsibility. Then Deborah and Baby's mom wear yellow and have light hair. The bands on the money are yellow, she's lit with a yellow light at the diner. Yellow signifies moving forward and leaving his life of crime behind. You know I gotta talk about attention to detail. I know I'm not an easter egg channel, but when it comes to Edgar Wright, they're woven into the film so beautifully, each is its own win. And the reason the detail lists are always so long in Edgar Wright's films is because of how detail-oriented he is and how often awesome details repeat. Transitions. Less of them than in other films, still epic yet understated and smooth. Like this little eyeline transition. 
or how you start to realize the reason Baby has all those different iPods is because he's been boosting cars since he was a kid and stealing people's iPods. The one he got as a gift got smashed in the crash. Or how his undershirt slowly darkens as he slips to the dark side of crime. Or how often someone predicts the sound with the point of a finger. Right. Here. You're going up in the world. Tequila. Timing with music is just integrated into everything. Ugh, little timing cues. Ugh, amazing. Or how often lyrics perfectly describe what's happening in the film. When something is wrong with my baby. The lyrics on the street, the tinnitus ringing, the postcard foreshadowing where Doc probably got his name, the fact that Baby pulls up to hear no evil. and see no evil at the armored truck heist. So many little touches, like of course JD left his shotgun behind, he's the only one without a strap. It goes on and on. And the final detail is something that took me multiple watches to figure out. I knew that every cut in this TV watching scene was important and I'm finally realizing that the bull was foreshadowing Baby's final battle with Buddy. He's had his tries from horseback. Now, he must try to end this on foot. Getting off their horses out of their cars and battling on foot, constantly tricking a bloodied buddy like you do with the red cape. And I'm sure there are more little details that I missed. This is one of those films where the camera operators, boom operators, and grips all need to be praised because they're responsible for so much of what we see and how it's presented to our eyes and ears. And then at the heart of all of it is this sweet and simple love story. Ansel and Lily have such great chemistry and play so well off each other. It's also a story of taking responsibility and finding redemption in doing so. And ultimately, Baby is just a likable kid, someone we can really relate to. Although, Baby makes his mixtapes old school, analog, the way us old fogies used to do it. Really just a crazy labor-intensive way, especially when he basically uses MIDI recordings anyway, no real instruments. It would be like opening up Notepad and starting to code a website from scratch. That's dumb. Don't do that. That's why we have Squarespace. Ah, you like that segue, don't you? But seriously, take it from someone who has opened up Notepad and started writing HTML and CSS from scratch. There is absolutely no need to do that anymore. Squarespace has awesome customizable templates to help you get started making your own website. The idea of making a site is daunting, I know. I put it off for way too long myself. But I've gone through the gamut of ways to build sites and Squarespace is by far the easiest and most user-friendly way to do it. I'm in the middle of building a new site for CinemaWinds right now and I'm kicking myself for not doing this two years ago. I could not be more pleased. Wanna sell stuff? Squarespace will get you making money faster than you can come up with new product ideas. Nothing to install, no patches or upgrades. Want to start a blog about how much you love my channel? You can have a professional looking site by the end of the day. And my undying affection for all eternity. Squarespace will help you create your own, say, life wins. So head on over to squarespace.com for your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com backslash cinema wins and use offer code cinema wins to save 10% on your first purchase. Over here is Eddie No-Nos, formerly Eddie the Nose. That's a No-Nos, No-No, page one. An insider with a nasal problem. The nose bag is empty. Someone at the depot has a nasal problem. 